The Orphans of Simitra. Chapter 12. A Missing Boat. Mina had not back. Next morning, they all tried to believe that, as the customs man had suggested, she had spent the night in some makeshift shelter and would return of her own accord. But that hope soon left them. Anxiety grew into anguish. Porphyrus, beyond tears, was completely overwhelmed. Mrs. Van Coolen stayed with him the whole morning. While the farmer, who had harnessed his best horse, went to Crudenan to inform the burgomaster of the child's disappearance, and to give the police all details, his wife did what she could to get to the bottom of the mystery. Are you quite sure, Porphyrus, that she told you morning? Nothing. Yet you seemed so worried yesterday when you and Pete came back from Crudenan. I didn't pay much attention at the time, but I do remember that you asked me where Mina was the minute you got in the house and Pete tells me you got in the house and Pete tells me you were anxious to leave the garage much earlier than usual. I know, I was a bit worried. You know, you can speak quite freely to me, Porphyrus. Did anyone on the farm do anything to upset her badly? People are sometimes clumsy even when they don't mean to be. Oh no, Mrs. Van Coolen, Mina loved you all. You've all been so good to her. Well, then. I just don't know. Could it be anything to do with that letter you had from Greece? Porphyrus hung his head and his face grew red. There was a silence. Yes, perhaps he said. For a moment he hesitated. Then he realized that even if it hurt Mrs. Van Coolen, he must tell her what had happened. He explained how unhappy Mina had been since her arrival in Holland because she could not get used to a country so different from her own. She was afraid of the coming winter. So one day he had written to the orphanage at home. Oh no, he'd said nothing against Mr. and Mrs. Van Coolen, simply that Mina was unhappy and the Dutch sky always sad. The answers had been a terrible shock to Mina. And that's all said Porphyrus. That's all I know but please don't think that she was unhappy because of you and I'm sure she didn't mean to run away. He looked up. Mrs. Van Coolen was crying. Poor children. She murmured, taking Porphyra's hands in her own. I understand only too well. Nothing can ever take to place of our own country, our own home. Don't try to apologize. I feel we should apologize to you, because we don't always know how to help you to forget your grief. I did so hope that this house would become your own. Still, what you tell me gives me a gleam of hope Mina will come back. Where could she go? What would become of her? without you. The poor little thing. Porphyrus allowed himself to feel hopeful again. The burgomaster of Crunan had put an announcement about the disappearance of the little Greek girl in all the regional newspaper of Gudaran, in case anyone should come upon her. Two days later, in the early afternoon, a stranger appeared on a bicycle and knocked at the farmhouse door. Porphyrus went pale when he recognized the long green oil skins worn by the fishermen of Zealand. Oh God! Had his sister's body been washed up by the sea? I've come about that little refugee you had here the stranger was explaining to Mr. Van Coolen. I saw the notice in the paper. I didn't want to disturb you for nothing but at the same time I thought tell me quickly. Well, I don't know anything much, really, except that the night the little girl disappeared my small sherpa went to. Porphyrus shivered. Where do you come from? Mr. Van Coolen asked. From Zijan, three miles away from Zijan. Mina could never have covered such a distance by night and what would she be doing with a sherpa? The man shrugged his shoulders. Exactly. That's just what I said to myself. But I thought I'd better let you know, because of the coincidence. My boat didn't untie itself from the dike. Mr. Van Coolen thanked the fisherman for the trouble he had taken, and asked him into the kitchen for a cup of coffee. Well now, Porfras the farmer said. As soon as the stranger had gone off on his bicycle. What do you think about that? Porphyrus had seen plenty of share boots, small flat bottomed boats that fishing boats towed along when the sea was not too rough. Mina was terrified of water, he said, especially the sea. She would never have dared to get into such a small boat all by herself, at night, but she does sometimes do unexpected things. The following day, he went off the sea for himself, the tiny port of Zijan hollowed out of the massive sides of a dune. He found the fisherman without any difficulty, and the man showed him the exact spot where his sherpa had been anchored. That night the man told him, the sea was as wicked as a dog when you snatched his bone away. 
the bravest girl in all Zealand wouldn't have dared face it and you say you sister was scared of water. Why, then, leave Emily, should she take my boat? Porphyra's returned to the farm very downcast. Days went by, bringing no trace of Mina. Every morning Mr. Van Hulen harnessed his mare and went to the town hall, the town hall, in case the Coast Guard had recovered the body. The whole farm was sad and silent. Porphyra's hardly slept or ate. His eyes were enormous in his thin face. At night he told himself endlessly. It's all my fault. I shouldn't have left her that day just because of the doctor's car. I wanted to see it too badly. I love cars. I hate garages. If I still had my tunic and my cap, I'd tear them to pieces and trample on them. As the best way of punishing himself, he tore up all the picture up on his bedroom wall. Every morning he went to meet the mailman, in case Mina should write. The rest of the time he searched the house from attic to cellar, believing that she must have left word somewhere. No one from Simitra would have recognized Porphyra's, the Porphyra's who found life good and believed in love. Now shadows made him tremble. If a duck the seagull, born by the wind, uttered its harsh scream over the house, he would tear out in a frenzy, because he thought he had heard his sister calling for help. And everyone on the farm tried to soften his grief, to help him go on hoping, even though no one believed any longer that Mina would come back. You know you can't take my word said fat, good-hearted Pete. Everyone knows I never tell lies well, then, I tell you the sea never waits so long to give up its dead. Cross, my heart, Mina didn't mean to run away, and she hasn't fallen into the sea. I know she'll come back, Porphyra's. She will come back. She will come back. Those were the only words he heard. Porphyra's, too, went on saying them but not aloud. He was afraid of lying of deceiving himself. The week passed, another, and yet another. Each day brought winter one step nearer. In Holland, winter is never terrible, only damp and gray. Porphyrus had no interest in anything, not even in school, he went there only to kill time. Not once had Pete been able to persuade him to visit Kroonan. No, Pete, I'll never stop in front of a garage again, never. He spent his free half-day scribbling Greek words on paper torn from his exercise books, and going off alone on his bicycle, pedaling furiously against the wind. I'm afraid he's going a little crazy Pete told his mother one day. I followed him, without letting him catch sight of me. He's carrying bits of paper around, and he puts them in the field, on the shore, all over the place, with stones on them to stop them from being blown away but Porphyrus was not at all mad. If Pete had known any Greek, he would have read or, Mina, forgive me. Or elsewhere, I promise never to think of cars again. And if Pete had been able to look into his friend's mind, he would have realized Porphyra's knew that Mina would never find those papers. It was simply a way of taking the edge off his unhappiness. The day came, however, when his grief was unendurable. Porphyrus genuinely saw no reason to go on living. Whether he returned to Greece without Mina, or stayed in Holland, life had no meaning. More and more frequently, he wandered along the Kleindale. Its waters were so calm, so serene, and so happy. It had no thoughts, and nothing it contained, its grass or its pebbles, was burdened with thinking. One day he approached the very edge and sat down on the sodden grass. The water doesn't move, it seems to be asleep. I wish I could sleep again. Then he leaned over, his heavy head all forward. A passerby, strolling along the bank just then, wondered what the boy was looking at so intently on the surface of the water. Porphyrus was not looking at anything, he was waiting for his feverish brain to be at peace. He had to wait a long time. Suddenly there was a slight noise in the water. Plop! The placid surface wrinkled into winding circles. The frog had just hopped into it. The frog! All at once Porphyrus saw Papa Christopher in his mind's eye heard him laughing and saying red attracts frogs, not cars. It was the day they had discussed his red overalls. Memories crowded in upon him his mother, Simitra, the shining skies of Greece. Lovely memories are a wonderful treasured house was it really true that there was no more happiness for him? Suddenly his desolate eyes saw in the water, or rather in the sky reflected in it, a little patch as blue as the Greek sky. Porphyrus was back in his own land. 
and it seemed to him that the warm wine of Thessaly was touching the nape of his neck. Could it be? He came back to the present. A cow his neck. Could it be? He came back to the present. A cow was watching him, waiting patiently for him to move so that she could come down to the kind ale to drink. He knew her well, she was called Motit. Mina had once tried to milk her tail. A little smile flickered across his face. Mozit was a good beast, he began to scratch gently between her horns, and she seemed to like it. Tell me, Mozit, do you remember mine? Animals know things that human beings don't. Mina isn't dead, is she? Tell me she isn't dead. Mozit looked at him as if she had understood the question, and slowly swung her great beak from left to right. She had certainly said no. Mina was not dead. Porphyrus cradled her big head in his arms and kissed her between the horns, saying Mina. Mina. You're not dead. He set off for home, tearing across the fields like someone who had just discovered a long-lost treasure.